Let us read our text for this evening, Psalm 32. Read by. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night, my hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thy forgives the iniquity of my sin. Is it true that a child of God can do whatever he likes because God is a forgiving God? Is it true that our Father in heaven will simply look the other way if we presume to walk in sin? That was what David thought. So David presumptuously walked in sin. And he believed for a time that he could get away with it. He was wrong. And the very last words of 2 Samuel 11 tell us that he was wrong. After a long explanation of David's sin, all of his covering up of his sin, the last words say this, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And Psalm 32 teaches us how David came to know this. Remember that David is here teaching transgressors Jehovah's ways. And he uses himself in this psalm as an object lesson. He tells us that he learned this lesson the hard way. And in so doing, he wants us not to have to learn this lesson the hard way. David's way was the way of impenitence, the way of walking for a long time in sin and refusing to confess that sin, the way of backsliding. Here was a child of God who departed from the Lord and from the ways of the Lord for a considerable period of time. And he thought that Jehovah wouldn't know. He thought that he had hidden all of his tracks, he covered all of his tracks by killing Uriah the Hittite. He did not reckon with the fact that the thing that he had done displeased the Lord. And God would not let David walk in the ways of sin. Jehovah, in his faithfulness to David, in his faithfulness to the covenant, stretched forth his hand and chastised or chastened his son, David. Notice then Jehovah's chastisement of the backslider. Jehovah's chastisement of the backslider. Notice first of all it is painful chastisement, secondly necessary chastisement, and thirdly effectual chastisement. David sinned grievously. Jehovah was angry. David experienced Jehovah's wrath. That's how you can summarize all of the events in this part of David's life. That's David's testimony in Psalm 32. And that experience of chastisement was painful. And so David writes this psalm to warn other would-be transgressors and to warn other would-be backsliding children of the consequences of their actions. David experienced Jehovah's displeasure. The thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and he showed that by putting his hand upon David. Thy hand was heavy upon me. The hand in Scripture is the symbol of the exercise of God's power. Think of your own hand. You conceive in your mind that you're going to do something, but you do that thing with your hand. You think first, then you act with your hand. God, eternity, conceived of everything that happens in history. That's his counsel. In time, his hand is his working of providence 
throughout the history of the world, bringing to pass that which he conceived in his mind in eternity. And the hand is incredibly versatile. With one hand you can gently lift something, and with the same hand you can crush that thing to pieces. With one hand you can lift something and mend it, the very delicate parts of it, put it together. With the other hand you can smash it to smithereens. And David has learned that the hand of God is incredibly versatile. With that hand, God can gently lead his people, and with that hand, David has discovered, God can chasten his people so that they experience that hand heavy upon them, that painful experience that David had. <clears throat> and that's true with parents today as well. A father with the one hand can gently caress his daughter's bride and with the same hand can give her a sound spanking. That is what God does when he chastens us. As it were, he gives us a sound spanking. That's what David experienced and tells us about in Psalm 32. There are three main functions of God's hand in connection with his people. First of all, God's hand protects. We are safe in the hand of God. We find refuge in the hand of God. People say, I'm in God's hand. I'm in a safe place because I'm in God's hand. Jesus Christ talked about his sheep being in his hand and in the Father's hand. Second, the hand leads and guides. He gently leads or prods his people in the right direction, the way in which they should go. That's what a loving, vigilant parent will do. Take his children by the hand and lead them, direct them in the right path. But third, God's hand punishes or chastens. Speaking of wicked, we read that none can deliver out of God's hand. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hand of the living God. And David experiences in verse 3 this third function of the hand. The hand of God was heavy upon him. It was an oppressive, pressing, crushing weight under which David was squirming. But he was trapped and squirm as he could. There was no escape from that hand because day and night, we are told, it was upon him. There was no relief, no let up. He experienced the crushing hand of God. That was God's displeasure. When he tried to sleep, he experienced the same displeasure from his God, pressing down upon him, making him feel utterly miserable because of his guilt. And the effects of this hand are two. First, it was a bone-crushing effect. My bones, he says, waxed old. The idea is they decayed, they became worn out, they wasted away. A man's bones are his inner substance and usually the most substantial and solid part of a man's body. And David felt as if he were an old man whose bones were wearing away under the wrath of God. He felt tormented in his soul. Don't imagine, beloved, a physical disease here. There's no indication in this psalm or in the background in 2 Samuel that David was physically sick. Outwardly, everything seemed to be well with David. But deep in his heart and in his soul, he felt miserable. There was turmoil within the soul of David. There was oppressive, unending guilt. And he could not get any rest day or night from the sense that God was angry and displeased with him. Second, there is this terrible thirst. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. Again, a figure for the oppressive sense of of guilt. Before this, David had known that God is a fountain 
of living water. He experienced sweet fellowship with Jehovah his God. Now he feels dried up in his soul. There's no vitality left in his life. There's no experience of fellowship anymore with God. All he knows is God is angry with him. God's displeasure has dried up all of his joy and all of his peace. It's like the hot summer sun beating down upon the ground, evaporating all of the moisture from the ground and making it totally dry. And David felt totally dry. And yet sin had promised him so much pleasure. He can have whatever he wants if he sins. And now he feels dry and wilts under the displeasure of God. David is now experiencing, he's now recounting this, the way of transgressors is hard. Proverbs 13 verse 5. Or Jeremiah 1 19. Know therefore and see, it is an evil thing and a bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. This heavy hand and this unbearable oppressive heat withering David caused him to roar. Speaking of my roaring all the day long. Verse 3. David roars in distress. The word roar there refers to the cry or the groan of a wounded animal. Don't imagine, as I said, this is some kind of physical thing. Don't imagine an audible roaring that David went around screaming day and night. Rather, it's the idea of a silent groaning, the pains of an awakened conscience, the torments of an uneasy soul. Perhaps when he was alone, he gave expression to that by roaring. But it was a deep emotional anguish. The hand of God was crushing him. The heat of God's wrath was drying him up and his soul roared with pain within him. And this was a roaring all the day long. That's how David felt. Withering under God's displeasure. No relief. No escape from the heavy and of Jehovah his God. And this roaring all the day long did not bring David any relief. Quite the opposite, we read. My bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Roaring, groaning, complaining, crying buckets of tears, experiencing distress over sin, especially distress over the consequences of sin, will not bring relief to a troubled conscience like David. The only way in which David is going to experience relief is the way of confession of his sin and returning away from that sin. He has the conscience of a backslider and he can have no relief until he turns anew to God. David roared. David cried, David groaned, David withered under God's hot displeasure. David felt crushed. How awful, how indescribable. Let these words, beloved, be a warning to us. We do not want to have to experience what David recounts in Psalm 32. And David writes this under the inspiration of the Spirit of God to warn us the church of all ages, that this is what will happen to someone who walks presumptuously in sin. God will chastise them. Now remember that chastisement is discipline or correction by a parent. A father or a mother will chastise their son or daughter. It is not the same as punishment. They look <coughs> the same outwardly. They seem to be the same, but in fact they are different because they have different aims. God punishes the wicked. 
And in punishing the wicked, his aim is the wicked's destruction. He punishes them, thrusts them away from himself in his wrath, and destroys them eternally in hell, in everlasting misery. But God chastises his own children, and in that chastisement, his aim is their salvation. His wrath is really and truly displayed. He is actually angry with his children. Some people think that God is never angry with his children. David says otherwise. David was a child of God, but God was angry with David. But this anger is the anger of love. And godly parents know the difference between those two kinds of anger. And so do children of godly parents. A father can be genuinely angry with his children. In fact, he can be furious with his children. And yet, he can still love his children. And that's the experience of David in Psalm 32. God loved David, but God was furious because of what David had done. But the experience of chastisement, even though it comes in the way of God's love, is never pleasant. And David testifies to that. The consequences of backsliding are severe. We must never presume, as David did, to sin and think we can get away with it. David covered his tracks as best he could. He got rid of the evidence, as it were. He removed Uriah the Hittite out of the picture. He felt he was safe. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. The devil said, there's pleasure in sin. David says, now, what pleasure I thought I could receive from sin has now dried up. There is no pleasure in sin. There's only God's heavy hand upon me and it caused me to seek the mercy of my God. Don't trifle with sin, beloved. That's the message of our text. It was necessary for Jehovah to chastise David and to chastise David severely because of David's sin and especially because of David's impenitence. David sinned. We read about that this evening, what he did. Now all of us sin. All of us have thousands of sinful thoughts. We harbor lust and pride and envy and hatred in our hearts so often. We don't sin though as David did usually. David's sin took a specific form. We saw last week it was transgression, iniquity, sin, and guile. We saw that he rose up in rebellion against God. He trampled God's law underfoot, showed utter contempt for the lawgiver behind that law, and hatred for his neighbor. David's sin here was not a lapse of character, a minor fault. It was a deliberate act of rebellion. It was premeditated. And he sinned against what he knew was the law of God. He went on regardless of what God's law said. As it were, thou shalt not commit adultery, and thou shalt not kill, were written in great neon lights before him. And he went on, ignored those warning signs, and sinned. Because God's law at that point had become an inconvenience. And he preferred, David did, at that point, he preferred pleasure over obedience to God. And if you had said to David a few weeks before this sin took place, David, is it wrong to commit adultery and then to murder a man to cover up your sin of adultery? David would have said, of course it's wrong. It's a dreadfully wicked. Such a person deserves to die. 
And if you had said, and David, would you ever do that? He would have said, God forbid that I should sin against my God and do that. Obedience to God's commandments, beloved, is theoretical until those commandments become an inconvenience and get in your way. The real test is not to speculate about what would be righteous or wicked in any given circumstance. The real test is when the law of God is in front of your pathway and you want to do something which the law of God forbids and the law of God becomes an inconvenience. David's theoretical knowledge of the seventh commandment went out the window when he saw Bathsheba. He asked, who is this woman? Oh, that's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. At that point, Imogen said, oh, okay, she's married. Hands off, but he didn't. David's theoretical knowledge of the sixth commandment was cast aside when Bathsheba announced that she was pregnant because then David realized my sin is going to be discovered. I'm going to have to get rid of Uriah the Hittite. Then it became more important for David to cover up his sin than to keep the sixth commandment. A young Christian might theoretically disapprove of dating unbelievers until he becomes infatuated with a certain pretty unbeliever. Then that theoretical knowledge goes out the window. Then dating unbelievers is suddenly a good thing. And there are all kinds of reasons why you should do such a thing. A person might think theoretically that church attendance on the Lord's Day is a good idea until, of course, it becomes inconvenient. It's harmful to your employment or your educational advantages. Your family don't approve of it. Then suddenly the fourth commandment is not as important as we once thought and it can be disregarded. Stealing is wrong until I am poor. Lying is wrong until I am in a tight spot. Idolatry is wrong until I am invited and pressurized by my family to attend a funeral mass. So the question is not what is theoretically what you should do when it comes to the Ten Commandments, but when you are tempted, what will you do? Will you be like David and cast the Ten Commandments aside, or will you be faithful to God? This chastisement was necessary too because David's sin was aggravated by several factors. David's sin was a gross public sin. The most serious violation of the sixth and seventh commandments of God's law. David didn't simply lust after Bathsheba. That was bad enough. He went the whole way and actually lay with her. David was not simply envious and filled with hatred against Uriah. He actually went the whole way and killed him in cold blood. He planned it. It was premeditated murder, which according to the law of man is the worst kind of murder. Second, David's sin was the sin of a believer. God is more provoked to anger by the sins of his own children than by all of the abominations of the heathen. The hand of God was not heavy upon the Moabites and the Ammonites and so on. They didn't break the psalm like this. But David experienced the hand of God upon him because he was a child of God. Do you realize that, beloved? And do I realize that? That our sins are worse than the sins of the unbelieving world. We sin against the knowledge of God. We sin against the goodness of God. And therefore our sins provoke God to anger more than the sins of the heathen 
in this world. And third, David sinned as a king. He was an office bearer in the Old Testament church. He was called to be a leader, to show by example the way in which a man should live. Instead, he scandalized the nation of Israel and gave occasion to the enemies of God to blaspheme the God of Israel. And that's the case today as well. The sin of a pastor, of an elder, of a deacon, or someone else in the church who has an office of some kind, his sin is worse than the sin of an ordinary member in the church because of his position in the church. He causes the enemies of God to blaspheme. But none of those factors was really decisive in the chastisement that David experienced. The fundamental reason for chastisement in David's case was his impenitence. David refused to confess and forsake his sin. And verse 3 begins with those terrible words, When I kept silence. When I kept silence. And that is a commentary on that whole period of history. A summary of David's behavior for nine months to a year. Between the time that Bathsheba came to him and informed him that she was pregnant, and even before that when he lay with her, to the time when Nathan the prophet came to confront David for his sin, he kept silence. Think about that. Bathsheba was pregnant. It must have been early in her pregnancy before she was able to show the signs of being with child. If she had been six months pregnant, let's say, there's no way that the scheme of David to get Uriah the Hittite to lie with his wife to make it look like it was his child and not David's child would possibly make sense. It had to be early in the pregnancy of Bathsheba. Look at 2 Samuel 11 and 12. Bathsheba has given birth at the end of chapter 11. So about nine months they have passed. The child dies in chapter 12 shortly after Nathan arrives. And that word for child in that chapter indicates a very young child. So we can say that David was impenitent, walking in sin, not confessing his sin, not turning from his sin for about nine months to a year. And during that time, David confesses in Psalm 32, God's hand was heavy upon him day and night. God dried up his moisture and made him roar in anguish. And for all that, David did not repent. What was David doing for those nine months to a year? He was acting as if everything was normal. He was keeping up appearances as king of Israel. He was refusing to confess his sin to the Lord. He kept silence. This means, for example, David would have gone to the regular services of worship at the tabernacle. He has to keep up appearances after all. He would have attended those worship services. He would have played the role of a godly king, of a faithful and devoted husband. And yet, all that time, he has a secret sin which he's hiding from other people and trying to hide from the Lord. He kept on appearances. He kept silence. In every sermon at the tabernacle, he would have heard the same accusing voice. Adulterer, murderer, God's word and David's conscience were two witnesses against him for those nine to twelve months. But he kept silence. And God's hand continued to press down hard upon him. And David's life was miserable as he shriveled up under God's wrath, but 
he kept silence. Sometimes asked, what is the one sin, the one sin that leads someone to be excommunicated from the Church of Christ? To be removed from membership of the Church and put outside the Church and put into the kingdom of darkness. What is that one sin? Is it murder? Is it adultery? Is it theft? No. It's impenitence. Any sin can be forgiven a member of the church, but if someone is going to be impenitent, that person cannot be forgiven. And someone who is excommunicated started a process. He committed some kind of sin, whatever sin it was. And for weeks, months, maybe even a whole year, he has remained impenitent in that sin. He has not listened to the admonition of the other members of the church. He has not listened to the admonition of the elders. He has despised the authority of the church. He has hardened his heart against God. He has kept silence. And eventually that person is put out of the church of Jesus Christ and declared to be a publican and a heathen man. And that would have happened, beloved, to David, but for the fact that God chastised him. David had to be chastised because David was a child of God, and God, who is faithful to his covenant promises, could not permit David to go on in his sin and to perish. God loved David. God loved David so much that he would not permit him to go on in his sin as if nothing had happened. Humanly speaking, David would have perished everlastingly but for the fact that God stretched forth his hand and chastened him severely. Had God done nothing, had God, God ignored what David had done, let him think that all was well with him. They would have been emboldened to walk into deeper and deeper sin and would have departed entirely from the Lord and perished. And so David's confession here is a testimony to the faithfulness of God. God did not let me go, he said. God loved me so much that he made my life miserable until I confessed my sin to him. He brought me to my knees. It was painful, but it was necessary, and I thank God that he did that. But the more stubborn a person is, as David was, the longer we persist in sin, as David did, the harder are the blows that God rains down upon his impenitent children. And sometimes that chastisement takes the form of very unpleasant consequences in our lives. God chastised the kingdom of Judah by taking her into the Babylonian captivity, dragging her off to a far and distant land where God was not known, where the heathens ruled for 70 years until she cried out in repentance to God. God chastised the prodigal son in Luke 15 by reducing him to poverty in a pigsty until he came to his senses and returned to his father. God chastised Jonah by having a great fish swallow him whole. And from the depths of that great fish's belly, Jonah cried out in distress to the Lord, and God heard his anguish cry. Some of God's people abandoned him for a while as David did. They try the world with all of its allurements, but God turns all of their pleasure into misery and pain and brings them back the hard way. Think of Naomi in the book of Ruth. She left the church of the Old Testament 
She wandered astray into the land of Moab, and God brought her back. She said, I went out full, and Jehovah hath brought me back empty. She lost her husband and her sons and all of her goods, but God brought her back to Bethlehem because God would not see her perish. And God will do that to his children today. He will bring them to dire straits sometimes, bring them to their knees to bring them back to himself. And God has a frightening array of various sticks and rods with which to beat his children should they stray away from him. Some of them he beats with the rod of sickness. Sometimes he beats them with the rod of imprisonment. Think of King Manasseh, who filled Jerusalem with blood. He was brought to a Babylonian prison, to a dungeon there. And then he cried out to God, repented of his sin, and was brought back to Judah, restored to fellowship with God. But God <coughs> reserves his biggest and most awful rods for his stubborn, impenitent children like David. Don't, beloved, tempt God to use one of those rods. This chastisement which David experienced was not in the form of unpleasant physical consequences such as becoming sick. Remember that God said, the sword will not depart from your house. And God said, the child born to you from Bathsheba, he will die. That happened though, after he repented of his sin. All of this hand heavy upon him, and so on, happened before that. Therefore, that's not part of what David is talking about in Psalm 32. David lost his assurance of salvation. Psalm 51 says, Restore to me the joy of my salvation. David lost it. God does not give assurance of salvation to his children who walk in impenitence and unbelief. He hides his face from them for a time. It's true that God still loved David, but God refused to display that love in the way in which he once had done. David had to see, had to learn the hard way that God will not tolerate this kind of behavior from his children. He had to see that God was taking his sin seriously. He did it for his own good. It was a terrible experience for David, and a terrible experience for God's children today. Spiritual life seems like it's completely dried up. God does not seem to be answering prayer. Guilt, oppressive guilt, is all the child of God feels. And God seems distant, and indeed God seems to be against such a child of God. All because he is walking in the way of sin and refusing to confess he is keeping silent. I think David said elsewhere, better is thy love than light. And now David is not even experiencing the love of God anymore. He experiences only the heavy hand of God crushing him from on high. But Psalm 32, beloved, is a beautiful proof of the perseverance of the saints or God's preservation of his saints. You might imagine reading this psalm that nothing could be as terrible as what David experienced. Crushed by God's heavy hand, one's joy and peace dried up under God's hot displeasure, one's bones waxing old, and one roaring all the day long. But there's worse. And the worst punishment that God can inflict upon a person 
is the opposite of what he does in Psalm 32. It is to give someone over to sin. And that's what God does to the wicked. Sometimes he makes a public example of the wicked by giving them some dreadful punishment. But more often than that, he hardens them in their sin and gives them over to more sin. God says to such a sinner, you want to sin? You don't want to keep my commandments? Okay, I will deliver you into the power of sin. But God does not do that. In mercy, God will not do that to his own children. Rather than that, he applies the rod and his hand. And when his children persist in such sin, he applies it harder and harder and heavier and heavier until they cry out for mercy. That's the way the parents are supposed to discipline their children. A loving parent who loves his children will treat them in the way that God treats his children. A loving parent will not indulge all of the desires of children for their own good. Because they love their children, they will discipline their children. What do you do if your child cries he will not eat his vegetables? Do you give him crisps and sweets and chocolate and ice cream? Some parents in the world do that. Then your child becomes an obese couch potato and has health problems the rest of his or her life. What about the idea today that you should never say no to your children because that would hurt their self-esteem? Then your child will become a spoiled brat who thinks the whole world revolves around him or her and will be a menace to society. But parents who care about the welfare of their children will make them eat their vegetables will teach them responsibility and will discipline them when they are naughty all for their own good. And that's what God was doing to David for his own good. And Jehovah's chastisement of David, beloved, had the desired effect. It wrung a confession of sin out of David's soul. Verse 5, I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. He said he would confess his transgressions unto the Lord. He would therefore express his sorrow over sin. We do that too with our children. The parents know the child has done something wrong. But the child will not experience the forgiveness of the parents until the child actually comes and confesses to mom or dad, I did this and I'm sorry. Then the child will experience fellowship again with the parents. Sometimes it requires some gentle prodding for the child to confess his or her sins. At other times, as in David's case, it requires a good thrashing for the child to confess his or her sins. But David's confession after this experience is full, it's frank, and it's free. After months of silence, most likely up to a year of silence, he now opens his mouth to the Lord and confesses his sin. Notice, I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. My sin. My transgressions. Not someone else's sin or someone else's transgressions. Mine. I'm making no excuses for them. I'm not trying to hide them anymore. They're my sins. And I'm sorry for those 
sins. Because David could not hide from Jehovah God. God knew. God knew his sins. And David had to come to understand that God knew his sins. And the only way in which he could get relief was to come and confess those sins unto the Lord. And the result is immediate, free, gracious forgiveness. David has lived in impenitence for up to a year. He confesses his sins and immediately we read, and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. David wants to shout this from the rooftops. Here's how foolish I was and I repented and thou forgivest the iniquity of my sin. Remember we saw last time that forgive means to lift up or to carry away. As soon as the words I am sorry for my sins left David's mouth, the hand of God as it were was taken off him and he felt immediate relief. A huge burden was taken from his soul. He experienced again the forgiveness of the sin. And so he can sing in verse 1. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit is no guile. And how was that possible? How was it possible that David could experience immediate free forgiveness of all of his sin? It was because of Jesus Christ. David knew because all of the promises of the Old Testament and all of the types in the Old Testament pointed and proclaimed this fact, someone is coming from Jehovah God himself who will bear the burden of his sin. That person, Jesus Christ, will experience the heavy hand of God upon him. He will be crushed on the cross and the crushing weight of our sins will be placed upon him and his experience of God's wrath will be infinitely greater than anything that David felt. All of the elements are there on the cross. He was crushed by the hand of God. It caused him to roar Psalm 21, verse 1, the same word, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. And Christ too felt that his moisture was dried up like the drought of summer. We read in the Gospel accounts that he said, I thirst. He experienced that terrible thirst as all of his joy was dried up under the wrath of God as that wrath came upon him because of the sin of David and because of the sins of all of God's people throughout the history of the world. That forgiveness was in Christ and David knew there was forgiveness with God. That's why David had the courage to confess his sin. He knew before he went to God that God is a God of mercy, that God will forgive his sin. He knew that God is merciful and he knew also how God is merciful in the way of a perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And David therefore teaches us this evening when we stray from God, God will bring us back. His hand will be upon us, and that will be a difficult and painful chastisement. If we continue in our folly to walk in that sin for a prolonged period of time, God's hand will be heavier and heavier upon us. He will apply the rod, because he will not permit any of his children whom he loves and for whom Christ died 
to perish. And we see that in Psalm 89, and with this I quote, Psalm 89, 30 to 33. If his children forsake my law, and walk not in my judgments, if they break my statutes, and keep not my commandments, then will I visit their transgression with the rod, and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness will I not utterly take from him, nor suffer my faithfulness to fail. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy faithfulness. Thou wilt not permit thy children to walk in the ways of sin or by severe consequences of chastisement. We pray that thou wilt not suffer us to wander from thy fear, so we might not have to suffer and experience that which David describes in this psalm. We thank thee too that thou art merciful, that those who come to thee confessing their sin thou dost immediately and freely forgive. And we thank thee that we have the experience of that salvation and forgiveness in our own lives, for Christ's sake. Amen.